I'm Jack Kennedy. And they hit a lot harder in my opinion too. What is up everybody? My name is Kayla McNamara and everyone's got a plan until they get hit with my views. I am Hunter Boss. He just wanted to go to the distance by the looks of it. But he couldn't even do that. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Hi everyone, we are the MMA Island Podcast, and we're here to talk to you about my bookie. Let's start with the NBA lock of the season. What is a lock? A lock, simply put, a bet you cannot lose. And with my bookie, you can't lose with the NBA lock of the season. When you bet on either team to score, whether that be the Dallas Mavericks or the Denver Nuggets, this Friday, you win. An NBA game has never gone scoreless, so you know this is a sure bet. Place your bet, then you score, then you win. It's that easy. Wake up Saturday and throw down in UFC 267, ladies and gentlemen. This weekend, my bookie is giving away a $100 bet on the big light heavyweight title fight between Jan Blakovic and Glover Teixeira. You cannot miss this. So don't wait. Head to mybookie.ag and use our promo code MMA Island and get in on the NBA lock of the season. Again, the promo code is MMA Island. It is a lock. Get your season started off with a win. Thank us later. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island podcast. I am Jack Kennedy alongside Kayla McNamara and Hunter Boss, and we have a great episode lined up for you guys today. Let's get started with the news. And Marvin Vittori beat Paulo Costa in a phenomenal fight night main event. Uh, lots of drama going into it, obviously, with Paulo Costa changing the weight two times. Uh, I'm, that's the big storyline of this. But some, somehow, Marvin Vittori got it done. Uh, and even though it was at light heavyweight, his stock has grown tremendously out of this. Vittori won. Hunter, what are your thoughts on this main event? Marvin Vittori has gained a million new followers of some sort. I mean... This fight was supposed to happen months ago. Then Costa needed it for it to change. So we changed it for Costa. Then fight week, first first time around, Costa couldn't make the weight. So we changed it to 195. We're like, all right, fine. Can you make the weight now? Costa, yeah, sure, I can make the weight. Two days later, can't, can't make the weight. Back to light heavyweight. It's insane. And then Marvin Vittori goes out there and he gets it done. He gets it done. He goes out there. His striking looked great. His defense looked great. His wrestling looked great. Everything about Marvin Vittori went up, I have to say. I mean, he went out there and he put on an entertaining fight. And that's what we've been getting him criticized for for the last few episodes of the podcast. Last, I think I've been on the podcast now for 15 episodes, 20 episodes now. Last 15, 20 episodes, we've been talking about how Marvin Vittori can't exactly make the entertaining fight and doesn't necessarily – deserve these title shots he went out there he put on an entertaining fight and he showed to everyone that he's ready for another title shot i mean i don't think he should get it right away i think maybe one more person then he should get another title shot but he went out there and he proved to everyone that he's the number two contender at middleweight for surely he all the odds are stacked against him i mean the weight issues uh the striking for andrew i mean paulo costa i think he looked around 220 when he went into yeah. that fight day, Marvin Vittori was still 204. And he still went out there and he had a chin on him. He was not being put away. He had a great chin. No shots. I mean, don't get me wrong. He got hurt at some moments, but he never got finished. And he went on the, out there and did what he needed to do. He had a great game plan. His coaches were fantastic. All the credit to Marvin Vittori. I think he won every round except round two and round five. But with the point deduction, he really only lost round five. So once again... Great job to Marvin Vittori. You have created a fan out of me, and I can't wait to see who you're going to fight next. Yeah, I'm not going to cover Marvin Vittori all that much because he's gotten the plaudits that he's deserved. Hunter summed it up perfectly. But Jesus, this was disgraceful from Paulo Costa. I've seen a lot of unprofessional things as a martial arts fan. I've seen McGregor throw a dolly through a bus. I've seen, we've all seen a lot of things. We've seen backstage fights. We've seen people jumping into crowds. Name it, we've probably seen it. This is one of the most utterly infuriating things I've ever seen as a mixed martial arts fan. Like Hunter said, this fight was meant to happen three or four months ago. Didn't happen, fine, we'll move it. 
Paulo Costa shows up to fight week almost casually, not even sorry, not even saying, I'm genuinely so sorry, I can't make the weight. Shows up like he just doesn't give a shit, saying, can't make the weight, just not going to try and make the weight. Marvin Vittori props to him, agrees to make this fight go up to 195. He was well within his rights to refuse it, but he went with it anyway. Then Paulo Costa comes out and says, actually, screw that, can't make 195 either, 205 or I'm not fighting. Quite frankly, lesser fighters would have been cut before the fight for this. Yeah. And I think Paulo Costa should be cut for this. I think it's the least professional class thing that I've ever seen in my life. No respect, no decency, no consideration for his opponent, and no consideration for the organization either. I just think it was an abhorrent display from Paulo Costa. And quite frankly, he showed what he truly is. You know, claimed he was drunk going into a title fight against Israel Adesanya, showed up disgracefully overweight against Marvin Vittori as well. And all that Paulo Costa's done is given Marvin Vittori a million and one more fans for this. You know, the fight, I'm not going to break down the fight itself too much because we saw how brilliant Vittori was. But this looked like a machine gun trying to pierce a tank's armor. And that shows you the weight difference that we saw in the night. Marvin, if that fight was a 185, Marvin Vittori would have knocked Costa out with some of those shots. But he was he was never going to get a knockout victory because there was just too much weight. Paulo Costa came in at heavy weight, realistically, when he stepped in the octagon. That's how big he was. So massive, massive plaudits. And I very much tip my hat to Marvin Vittori because he deserves all the respect he can get and then some. But Paulo Costa should hang his head in shame for this. And I hope he's kept away from the title picture for a long time for this. Yeah, hey, I completely agree with everything you just said there. And I actually, I'm going to go a step further. I think that this was planned from Paulo Costa. I think it was planned. The way he looked physically in there and the way that, you know, he kept changing or whatever, like, especially the first announcement to 195, he didn't seem surprised by it. He was just like, okay, I'm just like casually, I'm just like, okay, yeah, we're going to move this. Keelan, you're absolutely right about the second part of that too, which is not only would a lesser fighter be cut for that, that wish would have just been laughed at to move a fight a main event fight to a whole nother weight class, a catch weight fight, then to move it again. Look, let me say this. Marvin Vittori was one of our, on our negative side of this podcast. We were, we were Very much so. crap all the time. All right. He's not quite rackage level, but he's somewhere in between there. All right. For this, I think we can all confidently say he has jumped into our positive side. The amount of respect I have for Marvin Vittori, he is a true fighter's fighter, went out there, win or lose, even if he got knocked out in the first 30 seconds, my respect for him stays the same. He got the win, and I absolutely love it. That guy embodies what the UFC is about, what you want in the UFC, uh, and respect to him. And he was prepared to make the weight. You could see just the way their bodies looked in that fight. It was, it, look, Vittori was not in a, in 205 shape. He wasn't in 195 shape. He looked like he was there in a 185, you know, in 185 shape that had extra pounds on him is what he looked like. Paulo Costa looked designed for 205 in there. It, it legitimately looked like two different weight classes. And to emphasize how ridiculous this is as well, on fight day, Costa weighed 226 as the, uh, as the official report. Vittori was 208, which means basically walk, like he just walked around and drank some more water after that. For comparison, Steve Miocic, his last fight, weighed in at 233 pounds was his fighting weight. Paulo Costa's was 226. That just shows you how absolutely ridiculous and disgraceful and disrespectful Paulo Costa was and, and, and absolutely took advantage of the situation and still lost. So Paulo Costa's stock plummeting, Marvin Vittori, exact opposite, skyrocketing. And I think that's the big uh, you know takeaway from this fight. And we haven't even talked about the result. It's even more impressive that Vittori got the win at light heavyweight. And I believe his ranking will be, you know, Paulo Costa is going to be out of the middleweight rankings because he's not fighting at middleweight anymore. Uh, Vittori should be the number two contender, I think, right now uh, until after uh, Derek Brunson versus Jared Cannon here. Um, and yeah, I mean, just credit. To the, the big takeaway for me, credit to Marvin Vittori and you fought a beautiful fight. Yeah, that's completely right. That's completely right. And there's some other news that came out of this fight. 
Um, Paulo Costa is only allowed to fight at 205 now, yep. which yep. in my opinion is for the better. I mean, I, I like Paulo Costa at 205 because I like all the potential matchups we might see. We could see some absolute fun matches, like some absolute bangers that come out of this uh, new weight division. But Paulo Costa, I don't think should start very high, not even in the slightest. I think if when, when Paulo Costa does decide to fight again, when it's at 205, it better be a number 11, number rank, number 12 rank guy. He does not deserve anyone above the number 10 rank because that disgraceful performance. I, honestly, I would be fine with him getting a non ranked opponent because yeah. this it should not be replicated ever again. This should never happen again. And Paulo Costa knows that. I mean, I used to be a fan of Paulo Costa. I mean, he was a very entertaining fighter to watch. Knockouts left and right. He was 13 and 0 before he fought Israel Anansaya. Now he's 13 and 2. You know, he's not doing great right now. But I want him to bounce back. I want him to do good for the UFC because he truly is an amazing and uh, entertaining fighter to watch. So when Paulo Costa goes to 205, he really needs to pull his shit together, or else he will get cut. Yeah, to be honest with you, I don't really care about Costa standing at 205. I don't care if he fights I don't care if he fights Blakovich or if he fights someone we've never heard of. The way he conducted himself can never, and I love the statement that you both put on this, this can never be allowed to happen again. You know, Nick Diaz came in for Robbie Lawler and moved this up to middleweight, and now everybody thinks they can change the rules. This shit needs to be stamped yeah. out. This can't be allowed to happen. Quite frankly, the, what this fight raises is the issue that Israel Adesanya raised about fighters getting fined 90% of their purse for missing weight. Paulo Costa should have been fined every single cent of his purse. He should not have made a penny from this fight solely based on how he conducted himself. Marvin Vittori should be getting minimum a half a million dollar bonus, not just for taking that fight, but for winning against an over bloated opponent who had no intention of making the weight that he contractually agreed to. Quite frankly, he should be getting minimum half a million dollars on top of his win for that. And he should get every single penny of cost his purse too. The fact that he's only getting 20% of that is bloody criminal. Paulo Costa should never have made a penny from that fight because this is going to allow everybody, everybody's going to think this is okay now, be under no illusion. Fighters are not going to come in intentionally overweight. They're not going to try and cut and they're going to try and use physical advantages over people. This is why we have weight classes and this, we, this is why we have legal contracts to begin with. The fact that there's been no real punishment in this is what's sickening the most to me. Because Marvin Vittori is a legend for taking this fight, be under no illusion, but he shouldn't have been put in that position to begin with. The fact that he was shows you exactly what's wrong with the UFC right now. I am fully on board the city kickboxing Israel Adesanya model. These guys need to start getting big, big financial penalties for missing weight, or this is never going to stop. Cut 90%. Yeah. Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. And then what happens if Paulo Costa wins, right? If he wins and, and Dana White's like, oh yeah, he goes back down the middleweight. At the end of the day, uh, for a while, for a little bit, people will think about the weight, but at the end of the day, it, at the, whenever you see the scorecards, it says win loss. So if Paulo Costa wins, look, his, he's going to be up there in the rankings. And what do you do with Vittori? Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't cheat. He was cheated, but he's going to remain in his spot and it's, it's going to, at the end of the day, be an L. So I'm glad the results uh, ended up the way they did. And again, Marvin Vittori is an absolute machine for taking that and, and all credit to him. Absolutely. So let's move on to the best of the best. And we didn't also, we didn't only have a good UFC card uh, this week. We also had a great Bellator card starring Fedor Emelianenko, who got a first round TKO over Tim Johnson. Uh, pretty shocking. Uh, let's talk about Fedor for a second. Uh, he won in Bellator, obviously. Is he the GOAT at heavyweight? Where do we rank him in the GOAT conversation at heavyweight uh, all-time? Hunter, what do you think? Before all that, I do have to give credit to Fedor. He just knocked out his opponent cold first round at 45 years old. Yeah, Fedor definitely deserves to be in this conversation, no matter what you might think. But, here, there's always a but, right? But he didn't fight in the UFC, which kind of, it puts a stagnant on that on that record of 35 and or 36 and uh, I think five or six. 
But um, Fedor, all in himself, he deserves to be on the Mount Rushmore, I would say. I'd say top four heavyweights of all time. He deserves to be there. Number one, I don't think he's number one yet. I don't think he, I don't think he deserved it just because he wasn't in the UFC and he didn't win a UFC title. Now, that might seem like a casual point of view, but honestly, when it comes down to it, the UFC is the best of the best. And Fedor, he fought a lot of people who were in the UFC and were fantastic fighters, but he was never in the UFC himself. So that is probably the only reason I would not put him as the GOAT, just because we didn't see him go against the best fighters every single time. You know, He definitely did go against a lot of great fighters, um, and he definitely beat a lot of great fighters and a lot of great heavyweights at that. But I think when it comes down to the conversation, he's on Mount Rushmore. He's top four, maybe even top three for me, but he's not the GOAT. Yeah, I mean, it's not perhaps much of a shock, but I do agree with Hunter here. First of all, credit for the knockout, because that was incredible. Beautiful right hand against Tim Johnson. He just went straight to the shadow realm. What a performance from the legend himself, the Emperor Fedor Emelianenko. Is he the greatest heavyweight of all time? No. Is he in the conversation? Yes. That's the best way I can sum this up. And yes, he's on the Mount Rushmore, but there's three heavyweights that are firmly ahead of him. List these in any order you like. I won't necessarily fight you in the order. Cain Velasquez, Randy Couture, and Stipe Miocic, I have that are all better than Fedor in terms of a career record. Randy Couture, you know, first ever fighter, I think, to win a title in two different weight divisions, albeit not simultaneously. Stipe Miocic is statistically the greatest heavyweight of all time, most UFC title defenses. And Cain Velasquez really paved the way for the new hybrid of heavyweight that we see today. You know, not necessarily as tall, not an Alexander Volkov, but slightly shorter, quick hands, wrestling, stamina, big thing there stamina Cain Velasquez showed the way for the new hybrid of heavyweight that we see today in a Cyril Gann for example that's a comparison that I've made in the past look everybody loves Fedor Emelianenko anybody who knows fighting anybody who was lucky enough to see even the strike force days loves Fedor Emelianenko the problem is right or wrong yes or no whether it should whether it shouldn't not being in the UFC is a big asterisk against his, his argument for being the GOAT. It just is. And realistically, we could have seen so many super fights. We could have seen the Couture fight. We could have seen Cain Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos. We did see Fabricio Verdum, and he had that really, really nasty triangle that he ended up winning with, which upset the combat sports world, by the way. So I love... Fedor Milenko, always been a fan of him, always will be a fan of him. The guy's a phenom. The guy is a Russian cyborg. You know, he's just as tough as they come. He is built out of something else. Do I think he's on the Mount Rushmore of heavyweight goats? I don't think there's much of an argument against that. Do I think he's the greatest of all time? I don't think there's much of an argument for that, if I'm terribly honest. Mount Rushmore, yes. Greatest, no. Yeah. Hey, surprise, surprise. I agree with you guys. Um, so here's where I say though. So okay, let me break it down like this. First off, as you guys said, I have to say it as well. That was unbelievable. Fedor Emelianenko is 46 years old, and he's hasn't fought in like two years. Goes in there in Moscow in front of his home fans and knocks out the former Bellator title challenger in his last fight in like the first round. That is unbelievable, uh, and that is why he is one of the greatest heavyweight fighters of all time. Um, let me talk about this. Let me break it down. So number one for me is Stipe uh, because of what he accomplished in the UFC. The, the amount of title defenses he has was ridiculous. Having four at heavyweight, four title defenses at heavyweight is near impossible. Uh, and, and, and everything he did in his career before that, his entire career before that, working up to that, I think he is the greatest heavyweight of all time. Number two, I do have Fedor uh, ahead of Cain Velasquez and Randy Couture. And also I put DC up there as well. Uh, I think he doesn't have necessarily the statistics to back him up as, as one being up there for the goats of heavyweight, but with just, I think he was one of the best heavyweights to be up there and fighting. And if he didn't, if the only reason he didn't fight at heavyweight for the longest time was because Cain Velasquez, his teammate was the champion at heavyweight. If Cain Velasquez wasn't up there, we would have seen a lot more of DC at heavyweight. That's a different conversation. I don't know what I'm doing for Fedor at number two. I like him that because 
whenever Fedor was at his best in his prime, Pride was the best heavyweight division. It wasn't the UFC at the time. The UFC That's fair. The best That's fighter. fair. Pride had the best fighters in the heavyweight division, and that guy was dominant in the best heavyweight division in the world at the time. Now, why is he not the greatest? You guys said it. He didn't fight in the UFC whenever everything was established and under those rules and, and becoming a champion in the UFC. And I think arguably the best heavyweights at you know whenever it did happen went to the UFC. But whenever he was the champion, whenever he was the king at, in his prime, pride was the best, and he was just unreal at that. And then after that, he had, he's had a million fights, and he keeps winning, and he won in Bellator, became champion in Bellator, champion in Strike Force. He was champion in every single organization except for the UFC because he never fought there. Uh, I really think Fedor, confidently, confidently for me, is the number two um, greatest heavyweight of all time. Um, not number one. But I think, uh, you know, same thing you guys said. I'm repeating, I'm repeating what you guys said. Is he the greatest? No. But does he have to be in the conversation for the greatest heavyweight of all time? The answer is yes. And anyone who debates that does not know the sport of MMA. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page there. And let's move on to the discussion of the week. And this one, this is a fun one. Who has the best nickname in MMA? Hunter, what do you think? All right. The best. In all aspects, the word best. Yeah. Nickname in the UFC is the Korean zombie. Oh, I love it. Korean love zombie it. is the best nickname because not only is it marketable, you see it on all of his t-shirts. People were having trouble pronouncing his name in the first place. Chang Sung Jung. You know, it's not a common name, especially going over to America overseas. People don't want to hear that. They want to hear the Korean zombie. You know, this is like Apollo Creed when he's picking his opponent, Rocky. The Italian stallion, you know, yeah. marketability is one of the most important things for a fighter to have. And if you aren't marketable, it, you're not going to be super duper successful. So for the Korean zombie to establish his name as the Korean zombie, and you could see it showing up on every single one of his fights, instead of saying his last name, it literally shows the Korean zombie. You know, that is the best nickname. But my favorite nickname has to be the highlight, as in Justin Gage, oh, just yeah. in the highlight gate. Yeah. I mean, there's not a more fitting nickname except for maybe the Korean zombie than the highlight Justin Gaethje because everything he does is a highlight. You know, whether it be doing a backflip off the cage, whether it be knocking out everyone he fights or getting knocked out. I mean, the only other name I could even see possible for Justin Gaethje is just like the symphony of violence, you know, <laughs> just pure violence embodied. And the highlight, pretty damn close to it. So number one, the Korean zombie. Number two, Justin, the highlight Gaethje. Yeah, um, there's so many amazing nicknames out there. Um, it would be impossible to list them all. Um, my fan favorite pick is actually quite an obscure one, and it's Julian the Cuban Missile Crisis Marquez. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> what have you exactly. ever heard anybody's nickname be after a historical event yeah, during the Cold cool. War? That's insane. He can't fight in Russia. You can't have him fighting in Moscow, for the love of God, with a nickname like the Cuban Missile Crisis. What's going on here? Um, that that would be my fan pick, but if I've got my sensible head screwed on, which I probably don't have screwed on often enough, um, there's quite a few that I would pick. I love Valentina the Bullet Shevchenko. It's short, it's to the point, it's powerful like a bullet. It's perfect. Ruthless Robbie Lawler, never been a more appropriate nickname. Uh, Cain Velasquez, uh, Brown Pride, I really liked, um, just because it kind of worked with yeah. Cain Velasquez, pretty much. Uh, the truth is, there's so many nicknames you could pick. I love Korean Zombie, you know, because it just befits the character so perfectly well. Um, Demetrius Johnson, Mighty Mouse, worked perfectly. He was in the smallest weight division, and he dominated. He was the Mighty Mouse, literally. Um, I think... In terms of marketability and pure effectiveness, it's a split between Robbie Lawler and Valentina Shevchenko. It's a split between Ruthless and the Bullet. I just think they both match the fighters to a T, and they match the personality of those fighters just better than any other nickname could. I love that. Yeah, I love those picks. So for mine, I'm going to go old school. I'm going to go old school for mine. And for me, and I'm going to spout off three, and I think these are the three 
that come to mind. Oh, I think I, think I know where you're going with this. So number one. Number one, I'll start there. Actually, I might start, I'm going to start at three, all right? I'm at number start three. three. Start at three. Yeah, I'll start at three. I'm going to put Cowboy. Donald Sproul. Nice. That's I mean, a great nickname. I just – he embody, he is a Cowboy and goes out there and just everything about him, it's just – he that is his persona, much like the, the Korean zombie. You don't even announce his name whenever you're talking about him. It's just cowboy, just like the Korean zombie. I love it. Uh, so and and you know, he literally is. He is if some, if anyone embodied their nickname more than Donald Cerrone, I don't know who that is. Maybe other than Justin Gagey as the highlight, I don't know who that is because he is truly the cowboy, and I love it. Number two for me is Anderson the Spider Silva. Oh, yeah. I love it so much because. You know, he is the spider. He embodied that. Whenever you think of the spider or you think of Anderson Silva, it's almost like a trademark. It's like having almost a sponsor on your shorts. He is the spider, and I love it, and he embodied that perfectly. Number one for me, all-time nickname, my favorite, uh, and, and I think the best nickname in, in UFC history is the Iceman, Chuck Liddell. Uh, I, I, I really, I really think, I know I'm so happy Keelan's excited about it. Sick. I, I really, I really think this is the best nickname, uh, ever. It's just like, that was Chuck Liddell was the first real star that propelled the UFC into the first stage that enabled Connor to come in and other stars to enable it to be what it is today. And the Iceman Chuck Liddell, I mean, you see him at any other event that he goes to, he gets a pop that's just as loud as everybody. Everybody knows Chuck Liddell. He is the Iceman. That celebration, we go like, ah, and then, you know, it's just, oh, I love it so much. And that nickname with the, sh- alongside the shorts as well, the custom shorts where it's like the Iceman shorts. I and love the mouthpiece. It. Yeah. And the, and the mouthpiece as well. I love it. Yeah. It's got to be the Iceman Chuck Liddell for me. I think that's my, I think that's the best nickname in, in, in UFC and the in MMA. Yeah. Oh, that was insane. Yeah. Um, one one of the one that I'll put out there, uh, Rampage Jackson, Quentin that's Rampage yeah, Jackson. Yeah. That's a perfect nickname for yeah. a fighter. You know what? Better than Quentin, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry, Rampage, if you're watching this, I don't want any beef. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm changing my pick and I'm throwing my weight behind the ice. Man. Nice. I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to go watch him knock out Tito Ortiz again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I. Yeah, honestly, it's a it's a great one, but I do have to say that um, Dan fifty k i is pretty good too. Oh, I like that's a good one. I like that. Fun, so. I like that. Yeah, I also like uh, Vanderlei Silva, the axe. Oh, like the axe she murderer. Oh, ruthless. <laughs> to be fair, his I don't think his nickname's the best, but his entrance was the best. Yeah, yeah. The root sounds so nice. Yeah, we need that creepy down. announcer lady back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even gonna do it because I'll embarrass uh, myself, but you know what I'm talking about. She won championship, I think. I think she yeah. does win championship announcements. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's I'm, sick. I'm 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 90 sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, that is so sick. Yeah, I think I gotta be honest, I love the bullet and ruthless, but I think the spider and the ice man, I think they're probably the two best because you just they're I you just Exactly, and you can. How many images does your mind conjure when you hear the spider and the ice man? Like, if I see a spider, I don't think of a spider, I think of Anderson Silva. <laughs> he has trademarked the animal now, he is the spider. I've squished a lot of Anderson Silva's recently, all right? So, <laughs> yeah. hey, thought he would squish us. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, hey, this was a great segment, great podcast, guys. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. As always, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. You can listen to us everywhere, literally everywhere, including iTunes and Spotify. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island and check out our website, MMAIsland.net. Also, real quick, big shout out to our new sponsor, My Bookie. They are fantastic. Go bet through them. Again, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Great podcast, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.